The second law of thermodynamics is one of the great generalizations in the history of science. And in some sense, I think we do want to say that it applies globally. But whenever we offer the laws of thermodynamics as a supposed explanation for, say, complex organization of any kind, whether just a dissipative structure or a living organism, if we're going to try to lean on thermodynamics as an explanation, I think, well, we're going to have some explaining to do about this supposed fundament that we're placing at the base of nature. Because the thing is, you know, for entropy to explain how energy can perform work, you need more than just the idea of conservation and entropy. Because already baked into the idea of entropy is a constraint, namely that the molecules being modeled exist in a closed container of some kind. And these constraints um, are, you know, they're presupposed in our modeling of the dissipation of, of heat um, or motion in, you know, a chamber of gas, let's say. And so then the question becomes, you know, in order to explain the laws of thermodynamics, which you then want to use to explain life, and consciousness even, you first you first have to explain the origin of, of these constraints because you know you're really you're talking about order. You're talking about um, that which directs the energy and allows you to determine what would count as entropy. Right? Because after all, how can you determine you, you know the temperature of everything is in some sense by definition gonna be zero if temperature itself is a measure of movement through a gradient, then if you were to actually be capable of measuring everything, you, you wouldn't measure any temperature. All the motion would cancel out. But then let's just take a step back and ask where these constraints come from. I mean, in the reigning model of physical cosmology right now, the so-called Big Bang Theory or... Um, you know, this idea that the universe is an inflationary process and it's just heat cooling off. Uh, but where did it all come from? Well, in order to explain the level of organization present in today's universe, we have to assume that there was an original state of very low entropy, right? The singularity was somehow highly ordered and 13.8 billion years later, things have been... Um, falling apart and somehow, I guess as this story goes, the thermodynamic explanation goes, by falling apart, the universe has spontaneously generated uh, novel forms of organization, including life and consciousness, but it's all just been falling apart since the beginning. That's the idea. So I think, you know, already in the way that entropy is framed, there's the assumption of constraints and that implies something ingredient in the universe that's shaping the flow of energy. And you can say, well, the flow of energy itself can explain where those constraints came from, but, but no. It, at best, these are co-emergent principles, right? The idea of constraint and work. You can't define what work is unless you're already assuming constraints, right? And what seems to be really perplexing about life and consciousness, at least for the mechanistic imagination, is that, you know, life seems to be uh, a flowing energy which can construct its own constraints, you know, to varying degrees, at least. And so there's this recursivity that, that's, that's not merely um, symbolic, but uh, you know, it's, it's organic, it's molecular, it's, um, you know, this flow of energy capable of modifying its own constraints and operating parameters can then navigate an environment in a way that we call intelligent, right? 
And of course, we're going to want some continuity in the principles by which we try to scientifically explain living matter and minded matter or conscious matter. We're, we're going to want some continuity with, with that and how we under, understand physics. And so I appreciate the gesture towards a kind of thermodynamic explanation, but we really have to ask the question, what is heat? And there's a place where the modern scientific attempt to explain heat in terms of temperature, right, which ultimately is in terms of the statistical motion of molecules in some kind of container. Aren't we already defining heat in an abstract and so measurable, calculable way and forgetting and neglecting the only way we've ever actually known anything like heat through, you know, our own bodily encounter with it, that we are sort of immersed in, in this warmth ether, if you will, and, you know, our own bodies produce a certain temperature. And it's only relative to our own body temperature, right, that we can feel the temperature of our environment that we're kind of floating within. But we have to differentiate ourselves from the ambient environmental temperature in order to feel it. And of course, you know, this, the different people in the same environment will report uh, different temperatures. And we say, oh, well, you mean subjective temperature. But I think we, if we're going to really approach trying to explain the universe, including life and consciousness, we do want to look at heat. But we, we need to understand heat as we experience it most intimately and directly and say, yeah, that feeling is what is fundamental to this universe. So that energy in its flowing feels itself as it goes. And even at that pre-biological physical scale, energy is feeling itself as it flows in such a way as to be capable of learning, right? To flow more beautifully, to flow more intelligently. And maybe the learning process was a bit slower before cells emerged and before brains emerged. But I think there was still learning going on at that scale because there's already feeling. There's already aim 